collecting data. Once the greenhouse gas inventory has been planned and all emission sources have been identified, the next step is deciding exactly what information needs to be gathered and finding out where that information is located. Determining which information is needed is generally the easy part. For example, to quantify emissions from a corporate vehicle fleet, one needs to know the amount and type of fuel consumed by the fleet. In most cases, this information is readily available, but sometimes not. In fact, gathering the right data is often the most time-consuming aspects of developing a greenhouse gas inventory. Because data collection is time-consuming, especially if you are trying to profile the emissions of an entire organization at the end of a year, companies should consider developing a method of capturing greenhouse gas data on a regular basis. Often, this is best done while generating the first inventory, as it is during that process that you'll learn the location, the format, the frequency, and quality of the relevant data. One approach is to centralize the data collection through a company's accounting department. Most entities will have a dedicated facility that tracks financial expenditures. It is there that purchase records can be isolated and used to extrapolate fuel consumption, for example. Extrapolation We'll briefly discuss how financial streams can be used to extrapolate greenhouse gas information from employee travel. Companies typically reimburse their employees on a per-mile basis for work-related travel. And, the IRS's standard mileage rate for 2010 is 50 cents per mile driven. With this information, we can extrapolate that if a company reimbursed an employee $1,000 for travel, then he or she drove 2,000 miles. Now, if we can determine the fuel efficiency of the employee's vehicle, we can calculate how many gallons of fuel were consumed. Let's suppose that the employee's car averages 20 miles per gallon. Then, traveling 2,000 miles would result in the combustion of 100 gallons of fuel. By multiplying the emission factor of gasoline, which is 19.37 pounds of CO2 per gallon, we can deduce that this employee's business travel emitted 1,937 pounds or 0.87 metric ton of CO2 into the atmosphere. Collecting data efficiently. But realistically, extrapolating GHG data from financial information doesn't always work. Staff may use rental cars, ride on trains, so gathering bills may not give us always the data that we need. Thus, an important consideration when developing a GHG inventory is the extent to which future data collection process can be refined. Designing an effective GHG information stream often requires collaboration between the company, its employees, suppliers, partners, and IT experts. As mentioned before, one approach to collecting GHG information is to have the financial team intercepted from invoices and receipts as they make their entries. But because financial information sometimes lacks the details required to accurately calculate emissions, it brings us back to the need for collaboration between the people in and outside the organization. If a state agency has a contract with a car rental agency, it may need to request a periodic summary of miles driven by the hundreds of individuals around the state that use these vehicles routinely for their work. This is especially true if fuel purchases on the road are being paid for in a number of different ways, like petty cash, use of a PIN card, or by including it into the rental itself. Tracking the fuel would be a nightmare, but tracking the mileage driven might be relatively easy. So, in certain instances, entities can simply require their suppliers to include specific information in their invoices. 
In another example, a university may have multiple vendors who maintain cooling and refrigeration systems on its campus, but who don't itemize the type and quantity of refrigerants used during service calls. The facility management team then needs to sit down with those vendors and come up with a way to get that information on a regular interval. In yet other instances, entities can task their staff to, say, track fuel consumption from business travel and submit that to the designated inventory quantifier. In addition to collecting the data, companies, institutions and entities should develop systems for, to facilitate data storage. Good data collection processes include requesting data in familiar units, requesting data from metered or measured sources wherever possible, as they may be more accurate than financial records, performing regular checks to discover potential technical errors, like making sure the correct emission factors are applied when using Excel sheets, and sharing procedures and program objectives across departments within the organization to encourage participation and to improve the quality of data submission. Now, let's take a closer look at the data collection process by examining common collection procedures for scope 1, 2, and 3 emissions. Collecting data for scope 1 emissions. If you recall from the module on operational boundaries, scope 1 emissions are those that occur at sources that are owned or controlled by the company. The most common source of scope 1 emission is the combustion of fossil fuels. When gathering information for scope 1, the ultimate activity data is the amount and type of fuel consumed. The simplest way to collect this data is usually through fuel purchase records. For example, an organization may have gas furnaces and water heaters in their office buildings. Each month, the utility company sends a bill that states the quantity and cost of gas purchased. This information can then be recorded by the designated inventory team each month. But as mentioned before, some records may not include the quantity or type of fuel purchased. The first time an entity develops an inventory, it will run across a series of data sets which contain information in varying degrees of usefulness. A good practice at that point is to devise low-impact procedures that generate the cost and quantity of energy, refrigerants, and fuels purchased, and efficiently divert this information into a management system. Another source of scope 1 emissions are process emissions. As you'll recall, cement manufacturing has two main sources of emissions those from the combustion of fossil fuels used to heat up the limestone, and those that escape during chemical decomposition of the limestone as it is heated up. The latter is a process emission that can be quantified based on the amount of cement produced. If you know, for example, that every ton of cement results in 1,000 pounds of carbon dioxide, and your plant produces 100 tons of cement each year, then the plant's process emissions account for 100,000 pounds of carbon dioxide annually. The same holds true for many other sources of process emissions, where emissions are frequently proportional to the amount of product produced. Purchased electricity. When fossil fuels are used to generate electricity, CO2 and other greenhouse gases such as methane are emitted. Even though the emissions take place at the power plant and not the location where the electricity is used, the end user shares responsibility because they are generating the demand and are consuming the, the electricity. The activity data needed to calculate greenhouse gas emissions from scope 2 electricity use are normally kilowatt hours or megawatt hours of electricity consumed. This information can be obtained from the facility's monthly electric bill or from on-site meter readings. Here we have an example of a utility bill from a large multi-use facility. While this bill may appear intimidating at first, 
the only numbers that are of concern for the inventory are the total kilowatt hours consumed, which are circled in red. Sometimes, organizations cannot determine their exact electricity consumption because the costs are included as part of their rental payments. When this is the case, it may be necessary to estimate the electricity consumption. Specifically, the information needed is the total area of the building, total area occupied by the organization, and total building energy use in KWH or MWH. Using this information, one can estimate electricity consumption as a proportional share of utilized space. So, if the total area of a building is 100,000 square feet and a tenant occupies 20,000 square feet, the tenant would take responsibility for 20% of the building's electric consumption. This method is a little bit less accurate because it presumes that all the occupants use electricity equally, which may not be the case. In addition, this scenario can change the way in which the emissions are categorized. When utilities are included in lease payments, they may be considered Scope 3 emissions for the tenant and Scope 2 emissions for the property owner. This nuance varies with the protocol adhered to by the organization you are reporting to, so you should always check. The Greenhouse Gas Protocol, for example, considers this type of electricity consumption as a Scope 3 emission for the tenant and a Scope 2 emission for the building owner. Though we just talked about electricity here, the same data collection principles apply to purchases of heat and steam, which are the other sources of energy indirect scope to emissions.